<coughs> in part one, five requirements for type C reactions were established. Now we will show how those requirements were determined by evaluating changes in Murray's patented design. I stress once again that the equations and requirements are far more significant than the actual designs presented here within. The return path for Murray's bipolar field is both ugly and a manufacturing nightmare, so we will ignore it and wish upon a star that we can later make it go away. We are also taking liberties in our illustrations with some ratios that are critical to the invention. At first glance, Murray's generator seems quite simple. Voltage is generated by intermittently directing flux through the output coils. I doubt that the laminations were intended to do anything more than reduce eddy current losses. However, almost a year of my quest was investigating the flux gradients and boundary effects on similar devices and I am positive flux is disorientated relative to the laminations. This is the only magnetic device I am aware of that stores energy anywhere other than the motive gap and it is the most efficient device by far. If this internal en energy isn't the source of his validated ultra-efficiency, I'm dumbfounded. Some poetic license deviating from Murray's actual design is used in these illustrations. The goal was to isolate the source of energy through an evolution process. The first step, significantly reduce gap energy and torque by making the rotor homogenous, i.e. homopolar. Again with simplicity, all the spaces are filled with anisotropic material. A philosophical question while we wait. Is there an analogy between these laminations with gaps and air with partial pressure water vapor? Water vapor percentage is severely limited, but gap percentage has no bounds. Here we have achieved the second goal but with a hefty hit on the first goal. The homopolar rotor has constant gap reluctance, but the voltage is reduced by almost 96%. Output current is nearly perfect in that it only increases the disorientation between flux and laminations. Murray tuned his output coils, and we need to do the same. I realized that just moving the output coils to the outer e-core poles would get back 38% of the lost voltage. But I was greedy and I wanted the full 100%. This coil configuration satisfies my greed. Maximum changing flux through the output coil. Greed is one of the deadly sins, so there must be consequences. The consequences here come from Lorentz forces. This coil makes the rotor an active element and subject to those rules. Murray's skew angle and the Newtonian conundrum limit the forces to approximately 71%. The bottom line is a COP of 1.29. Ignoring specific power, the not-so-greedy 38% was a far better choice. Passive rotors are a must. 38% isn't great, but all things considered, it looks like the better direction to go. Now we are on the right track. We are homopolar with a passive rotor. The output coils are acceptably effective. However, the output coils are a bit soft, for lack of a better word. Flux can pass between the output coils without linkage. Voltage will drop off with relatively small loads. Being soft, the two coils in an E-core reduce the link flux differently, depending on whether they are connected in series or parallel. In series, the more orientated reaction is greater. In parallel, the DC field is repulsed. In either case, the total reaction resolves to the same minimum energy in E-cores, the subject of part 3. The low specific power seems like a spot between the proverbial rock and hard place. In more than one cla classic episode of Star Trek, 
Scotty, or Spock save the Enterprise in the waning minutes by changing the polarity of something from what it is normally expected to be. The two field magnets are normally aligned in mutual attraction. Why not try repulsion? Spock's logic would engage. Repulsing magnets would be ineffective in this location. Logically, they need to be moved. How about here? Here, my greed is nearly satisfied and my wish upon a star comes true. 100% linkage all the time and no need for the ugly return path. Through a torturous ordeal, only highlighted here, we have met all five requirements for a homopolar E-core generator stimulated by angular orientation. Spock's logic saves the day again. The generator is one, homopolar, by virtue of a constant gap reluctance. Two, a passive rotor in conjunction with the reluctance eliminates Lorentz back EMF forces. Three, Voltage results from swapping flux between E-core poles in lieu of pole area changes. 4. Flux swapping is stimulated by anisotropic orientation causing internal rather than cross-gap energy changes. And 5th, most important, a repulsion attraction cycle is established causing a dynamic minimum energy state. All that is left is retuning the lamination skew angles to match the reaction and more explanations in part three. Now coils and skew angles match the reaction. The smaller skew angle maximizes the reversing attraction and repulsion. This presentation is intended to stimulate independent evaluations regarding viability of both the fundamental principles and the application of the equations. A viability study will uncover the need for development work which we have already done. We wrap up with the thought that knowledge is a wonderful thing. What we've learned, attraction to minimum energy is absolute. Conservation of energy only happens most of the time.